are here, I would like to uh, introduce our very, very special guest speaker, Mar Jakar. He is a professor in the School of Research and Environmental Management at SFU. He's been recognized uh, for his work with the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change, the IPCC. He's a member of the Royal Society of Canada and has won many prizes, including the Donor Prize Award for Best Policy Book in Canada, the BC Academy Award of the Year, and several SFU awards, including the Sterling Prize, the President's Sustainability Award, and the Media Outreach Award. And also, if you don't know, he also was once arrested because uh, was arrested to try to, to stop a cold train. So if you want to know no, more about that, what happened, uh, Mark can tell you for sure about that. So with that, I would like to, to invite Mark uh, to the stage and thanks for being us, with us today, Mark. I will stop sharing now my screen so that you can start sharing yours. Thanks, Nastenka. Um... So I will share my screen. Um, are you seeing my screen? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, and thank you for um, uh, the, the acknowledgement of, uh, of the land on which, uh, um, well, all of us are on different lands probably. Um, and, uh, and, and thank you for the, the kind introduction about uh, uh, myself. So I'd like to get right at it though, because it, uh, it is about a 30 minute or a little bit more talk and I wanna have a lot of time for Q and A. Uh, I tend to find that there is a lot of questions about uh, after I give my talks and that's the fun part of it. So um, the focus of my talk is a book that I've just released uh, this spring uh, with Cambridge University Press, and it's called The Citizen's Guide to Climate Success. And it's deliberately a, a book focused um, not on uh, people who have a particular expertise in this area, but really for climate-concerned citizens. And thus the goal of the book is to help climate-concerned citizens detect deliberate delusions and inadvertent myths. So these are views out there that we may hold, not just people who are um, opposed to some of our views. They may be our own. And how do we know? Like, what, what is it that leading experts can agree on uh, and that we might want to pay attention to? Also to elect climate sincere politicians. And, um, and finally, even talk about our own personal emissions. And, and I'll point to two fuel switching actions that really take care of almost everything. So part of the message is that the, 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 the solution is a lot simpler than we might realize. And I'm going to be explaining the reasons why that is. And so I've talked about the challenge of delusions. And so I, my first couple of slides talk about this idea of human biases. And I, I get at this uh, here in the talk with a, with a couple of quotes, by starting with a couple of quotes. And the first is from Upton Sinclair, who was a writer, an American writer about 100 years ago. And he's quite well known for this quote. So some of you have seen it before. It is difficult to get someone to understand something when their salary depends on them not understanding it. And I think a lot of people will know what I'm talking about there. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm gonna bring in a second quote. Um, uh, this one's from Bertrand Russell, who uh, was, all, was a British philosopher writing about 100 years ago. And he said, what someone believes on grossly insufficient evidence is an index into their desires. Mm -hmm. So ways in which we might believe things in the case of Upton Sinclair's quote, because of self-interest, bias, maybe where we get our money, or, but sometimes it's, it's, it's not as nefarious as that. It's uh, what are our actual desires? How would we like the world to be? And how does that bias how we look at evidence? Um, I'm gonna tell a little quick story here about something that I do um, as, a, as a professor for almost 30 years now, I've taught a graduate seminar, and that means it's a, it's a course for master's and PhD students. They tend to come from Simon Fraser University, but also the University of British Columbia, and we hold some of the classes uh, in my house. So there's a photo of the class. You can see I add extra tables and so on, but it's actually in the room, in my dining room, in my home. Uh, it's the same room you can see behind me which is where my, uh, my best Wi-Fi reception is. So um, that's where I'm almost always on the internet. And um, 
what I wanted to point out is that in the very first class, um, and these are very bright students who have gotten into graduate school at UBC and SFU, and I asked them, what's your position on something? I don't know, nuclear power. Should we do nuclear power? Should we be doing large hydropower or biofuels or using fossil fuels with carbon capture and storage? What's your view on that? So they state their view. And those four examples I just gave, are usually quite negative. They really think we should just use renewable energy and do energy efficiency and conservation. So they give their p a position and they give quite articulate and you know strong arguments why we should not develop nuclear power globally or whatever. And, but then I each make each of them individually debate with themselves. In other words, I make them now give the strongest possible arguments that run counter to what they believe is, is the correct um, way to go. And it's amazing how poorly they do at that. And they soon start to see that each other are doing quite poorly. It turns out that even when we're in a tradition of academia with critical thinking and applying the critical thinking to yourself, that a lot of us have a strong tendency to think more like lawyers than scientists. So no disparagement of lawyers, but when they're working for a client, they are paid to only look for the evidence and arguments to support a particular interest or position or conclusion. And, um, and so that's different. The scientist is supposed to be excited, uh, or the critical thinking citizen, excited about information and evidence that runs counter and want to learn all about that in case they might then change their mind. So what I'm going to try to do in this brief talk and what I try to do in the book is to present people um, with evidence that is what the leading experts agree on. So this isn't so much on climate science, but on how we address climate science. And before I go a little bit further, I would just say that someone must have their, not have their mute on. I don't know if it's you, Nastenko, or anyone else, but I, I ask people to put their mute on because I'm picking up some other noises from other people. Um, so if we apply critical, critical thinking to the challenges of decarbonization, what, what's the first thing we know? We have to decarbonize. So we have to stop burning coal, oil, and natural gas, fossil fuels. Well, when we look at the expert research on that, what is really you know, the critical analysis, um, it leads to uh, sort of three key challenges that I want to summarize. And they're challenges because there are difficulties uh, that make it hard to decarbonize. And there are also things that we don't always sort of want to listen to the best evidence of experts. So here's the first one of those. And that's the myth that fossil fuels are expensive. All right? So we say, oh, well, fossil fuels are getting more and more expensive. And that's why energy efficiency makes money. You save on the energy or switching to renewables. But the evidence actually shows that fossil fuels are plentiful. The Earth's crust is chock-a-block full of them. They're a very high quality form of energy and they're low cost. <clears throat> and it shows that with innovation over time, their price has been continually falling if we correct for inflation. And finally, that if we decrease their demand, <clears throat> their price will fall even more, like even to much, much lower levels than it is now. And we just saw a little picture of that with the COVID, uh, you know, small decline in the demand for fossil fuels and an incredible drop in price. Um, but that's something that we've seen at other times and experts understand why that would happen. And therefore, fossil fuels still offer the cheapest development path. And I'm just showing you here a slide of what, how China rapidly developed its economy and the standard of living of its people uh, over about a 25 year period and how its emissions took off uh, in part because, or in large part because coal was plentiful and cheap for making electricity dramatic increase in electrification, but also for making steel and other products. And also they bought oil and produced some oil. Um, so fossil fuel consumption and therefore greenhouse gas emissions, as you see, surpassed those of the US, Europe, uh, and, uh, and did all of that in a fairly short time frame. And now that's the future for Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Indonesia, and so on. Um, Philippines, if, they, if we look at their cheapest development path, and that's why coal plants are being built in all of these places. It isn't because these people are just stupid and they don't realize that renewables are cheaper. So what does that mean in terms of how fossil fuels are going to grow, or greenhouse gas emissions are going to grow because of fossil fuels? <clears throat> this figure 
shows CO2 emissions and it divides the world into developed countries and developing, and I'll do that another time. It's not an easy distinction. China's in the developing countries category in this, and it's, it's both a historical record, but it's also a forecast from major organizations like the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and you see that the real growth in emissions is in developing countries, not developed. And so that's something that we have to be taking account of. And then the question is how we do it. For some people, it's, oh, well, we don't do anything in the developed countries. And that's not my message. My message is, though, that we have to be thinking strategically. And finally, I have a figure here that just sort of brings home the point that you might have heard from environmentalists frequently or renewables advocates that renewables are winning. This is absolutely not true according to the independent data. What this figure shows you is from the year 1990 to a couple of years ago, and um, it's just showing change in each year. The black column represents whether there's been an increase from one year to the next or a decrease in our use of fossil fuels, you know, measured in, uh, I think this is, it doesn't matter what's measured in. And the green one is, it's renewables and nuclear, so zero emission sources, but nuclear has kind of stayed the same, hasn't had big changes, so think of that as just renewables. And, you know, and I can remember in the 1990s, I can, the book has quotes in the 1990s of people saying renewables are beating fossil fuels. And it wasn't true then. It wasn't true in the 2000s. And it hasn't been true uh, in the last decade. And you see there, you know, it can fluctuate a little bit. But even after the Paris Agreement in 2015, when all countries of the world signed on to reduce emissions, we saw a dramatic increase in, uh, in um, fossil fuel consumption relative to renewables. And you do see that one year when the, it goes down for fossil fuels, 2008, uh, and then look at how it bounced back in the subsequent year. And I think uh, just to talk about the COVID, uh, you know, where we've shut down and we've decreased, so we, we're gonna have another negative line for fossil fuels in the next year, in this year, 2020. But it'll be interesting to see what 2021 and 2022 look like. Based on the past and what we know, I think you're going to see a big jump up again in fossil fuel use globally. So that was the first one, fossil fuels, cheaper, expensive. The second is that we've been living under a myth that we can achieve a voluntary global agreement. So, you know, we need a global effort. It's a global problem. Um, but we have no real global governance. We, we, so we, you know, we don't have a global government and therefore, we need to depend on global diplomacy, on countries working together. Uh, and in fact, that, that's especially because it, because it is a global problem. Uh, an individual country can't act alone, right? It, it can act alone and take some leadership, but there are real consequences to that. And that's, what, that's why we're not making progress on this. We don't have a global agreement. And so individual countries are going to do a bit, some of them more than others. But there's, there's you know, as soon as they move fast and hard, they put their own industry at disadvantage. Uh, and this is why it's, you're not going to get countries that really go out there. It, it'll be very few jurisdictions that do that. And at the same time, rich and poor countries get together every year, but they can't voluntarily agree on a fair sharing of the costs. The rich countries agree we ought to be helping the poor countries. Then they, you know, they put their demands on the table and they're miles apart. And they always will be because it costs a lot to avoid using fossil fuels. And rich countries, we're too selfish. We're not gonna suddenly double our tax rates in order to transfer money so that uh, people do renewables or nuclear or carbon capture and storage in the developing world. So we're gonna have to think about that problem too. And I talk about that in the book. And what does it mean though? Well, it means that for 25 years, we've had this failed voluntary effort. And, and this is a cartoonist depiction of it, sort of showing the year 2040 and you know, ocean levels so high that, that that's almost the only way you might ever get some kind of agreement. And so it's a bit of black humor, but it, it really, <clears throat> I wanna be careful about that because it really is a desperate situation if we had retain the mindset we have right now. 25 years ago, leading experts wrote and said, this voluntary approach will never reach an agreement. So it isn't like we're just discovering this today. Oh, gee, we have, people knew this. We know it now. Why aren't we talking about it? Why aren't we developing different strategy because of it, which is what I do in the book. And then the third of the three challenges from the evidence is the myth of an honest domestic policy debate. 
Um, so let's say you're lucky enough to uh, elect climate sincere politicians. And you notice how you, I use terms like climate sincere politicians and also climate concerned citizens. The climate concerned citizens are going to be a small percentage of all citizens, probably, like really concerned. And climate sincere politicians, um, you got to be lucky and you got to be skillful to get those. So, why are they challenged within, a, within any given jurisdiction? Fossil fuels are incumbent. So that whole thing about self-interest bias with the Upton Sinclair quote plays itself out. Those people tell us, oh, you know, we're going to get so many benefits from continued use of fossil fuels or development of supply. Climate insincere politicians can also fake it because decarbonization that I was describing, you know, phasing out the burning of coal and the burning of oil from, for mobility and moving people and things, um, that's a multi-gener, a multi-decade prospect. So an insincere politician can say, you know what, um, you don't need this regulation or this price or this policy. Um, we'll do a bunch of, I don't know, Rick Mercer commercials or vo voluntary stuff, which we've done. And um, we'll reach this target, the Kyoto target or the, the Copenhagen target or the Paris target. So it's really easy for those insincere politicians to sort of isolate the climate sincere politicians and defeat them electorally with faking it or basically lying. And in fact, I'll get to the word lying right now. Those politicians can also lie about the economic harms from the effective policies. So the policy might be a carbon tax. I'll talk about that later. Um, it might be something else. But uh, with the, something like the carbon tax, we've seen so much evidence for this. And it's not just in Canada. It's around the world. Um, when you try to use taxes, the climate insincere politicians can say, hey, Although those are going to harm people and um, there's no point, they don't do anything. And there will be, if there will be a small percentage of people that believe it, that's all you need to defeat a climate uh, sincere politician. So that we've got those three issues, right? And so because of that, it can look really, and then, you know, we're not making progress. And so, all, and then everybody adds in stuff they think. So the whole thing can look really quite complicated. And <clears throat> And in fact, I'm going to use a quote here to sort of portray that. I, I found this quote easily. I see these every day. I presume that most of you see these too. You don't have to follow this issue that closely. This one's from Lisa Song with uh, writing in ProPublica last November, but I could have taken it from anywhere. And she says, fossil fuels are so integrated into our lives that phasing them out would require us to change everything about how and where we live, how we get around, and how we make money. Now, I don't know what percentage of you listening to me right now um, you know, say, oh, no, I know that she's wrong. But my guess is from when I, when I speak live to people and ask how many, how many think that that's about right, um, it's an amazingly high percentage of, uh, of the listening uh, audience and even among climate concerned people. It just seems like, oh, my goodness, we have to do everything. Well, in the Citizen's Guide to Climate Success, um, I present a different message, and it's a message that I would argue, uh, that I do argue and, and have evidence that it's, it's the message that leading scholars would agree on who work in this area like I do, that the path is actually very simple. And now I'm gonna lay out the simplicity of it for you in the next couple of slides. What is that simple path? Well, we have to focus on key actions in key sectors. What would the key actions be? Well, I've already kind of said that. You phase out the burning of coal, oil, and most uses of natural gas. And so now we have countries that are doing coal phase outs. We have countries that are working on gasoline phase outs like China and Norway. And what are the sectors? Well, I've already said that too, electricity and transportation. But why is that? Well, you know, because the emissions, half of our emissions come from big industry in many countries and Canada's included. Well, why focus on electricity and transportation? First, we know we have the technologies and we know that the costs are relatively modest. Moving people and goods around will be a little more expensive as we phase out wonderful gasoline and diesel. And um, making electricity in, many, in most jurisdictions will be a little more expensive uh, as we phase out burning coal and don't replace it with a lot of natural gas. But overall, we know we can do that. We know the cost of the alternatives. Secondly, these are what we call domestic sectors because they don't affect very much the competitiveness of our global, our, our total economy, let's say of Canada 
or an individual subnational unit like British Columbia. <clears throat> you can un act unilaterally. You can show leadership as a country in these domestic sectors, even though it's a global problem. But when you try to dramatically reduce emissions in your trade exposed sectors, like you know, the major industrial sectors that have major emissions, so steel, cement, aluminum, chemicals, pulp and paper, uh, then as soon as you're increasing their cost of production, um, you're in trouble. And this is why even a leadership climate sincere government is going to be reluctant or and actually politically unable to make huge progress in those sectors. But there's good news to all of this because electricity and transportation actually are more than 50% of our future greenhouse gas emissions related to energy. And much of this will be in developing countries. Um, you know, we're going to make it with the developed countries, but for the reasons that I already showed you, it's going to be in developing countries. And uh, I've got a slide here that, that sort of simplifies that. And I just have to take a minute, though, to help separate this or detail this. The first, OECD is the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development. It tends to be sort of a collection of the more developed economies. So non-OECD, that was the developing countries, as you saw on a previous slide, including China. And the size of the pie represents the total amount of, um, of, of greenhouse gases, energy-related greenhouse gases, from um, those, those countries grouped in those two. And so one pie is way larger than the other for the reason you saw on a previous slide. It's because developing countries' emissions will be greater. This is for the year 2050. So it's a forecast from Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change on if we kind of just stayed the way we have been going, which is like tiny progress, but not a lot. So emissions are still going up. That's what they would look like. Um, that's the size of those pies. So just look at that though, the emissions, more than half of the emissions are coming from transport um, uh, burning of fossil fuels, the yellow, and from electricity generation, whether using coal or natural gas, the red. So I, I bring that out so that you see that you can domestically work on these two sectors and wow, they're important. And now we've got to be able to make that happen in developed countries and also in developing countries. And so the simple path is those two sectors, the phasing out of the use of fossil fuels, two key sectors. And, how, and then, so the second part of this is how do you do that? And again, it's very simple. Governments will give you long lists of the things they have to do. And the job of someone like me, and it has been that way for 30 years, is to say to people, oh, no, all that stuff is fluff. There's a few things they need to do. So they have to put in a few compulsory policies, and that will cause the decarbonization in those sectors I talked about. And this diagram gives you kind of a breakout here. What's a compulsory policy? Well, you can see it's gonna be some kind of regulation or carbon pricing. It really makes people act. It makes them decarbonize. They, they do it because to avoid a rising prices, uh, costs from a rising carbon tax, or because a regulation is ruling out, or also working to make things more expensive. The non-compulsory policies, which can be important to have when you also have compulsory policies, but what we had until 10 years ago is government sort of saying, oh, we can do it all with just providing more information to people, to putting labels on, fri on fridges and cars about how much energy, giving some subsidies for home energy retrofits, some government action, improving government buildings. That's kind of all governments did. So I categorize sort of all governments as insincere. Fortunately, I mean, we've just dallied so long and emissions just kept rising while governments said they were doing all these things, but it was all non-compulsory. There's been more and more of a recognition as of you know, 15 years ago, especially, that we need to have the regulations and carbon pricing. So we're now more in that world and it's more a question of increasing the stringency and not getting diverted from that. And the next slide just sort of summarizes some of the key points about compulsory policies. First point, you have to have carbon pricing and or regulations to drive decarbonization. Now don't misread that. I just, it does not say that you have to have both, right? There's an or in there. So lots of people will say, oh, you gotta have carbon pricing for sure, we'll never get there. That's not true. If I got all the, you know, the 20 leading uh, energy economists or climate economists in the world together, they would all agree that you don't have to have carbon pricing. 
if you if it's easier some other way, you could do it that way. So as I say, carbon pricing is not essential. If it's too difficult politically, perhaps regulations. And also there are types of regulations that can be politically easier than carbon pricing and almost as efficient and effective. And I don't have time here to talk about that. I describe it in some great detail uh, in one chapter in the book. And British Columbia, by chance, is a great example because us, like California, have a lot of these flexible regulations. And I can give some examples in question period if people want. And in fact, the regulations play a key role. And this next slide uh, brings that out. This is a, an analysis by the California uh, government institution about the reductions in California, both, again, a, a, uh, a historical record since 2010, but also, uh, this was provided a few years ago, a forecast of where they're headed by the year 2025. The size of the pie is depicting the amount of reductions in California from where they would have gone. So this pie is just representing reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. The yellow are regulations. The red is emissions pricing, something called cap and trade. Quebec has this, California does. British Columbia has a carbon tax. Both of these systems put a price on emissions, so they're carbon pricing. Um, but as you see, the regulations are doing most of the heavy lifting. They're the lead policies. Uh, one is a renewable portfolio standard to require a rising percentage of renewables in the generation of electricity. Um, a vehicle emission standard at the bottom, for example, in British Columbia and California, we have a zero emission vehicle standard uh, requiring a rising percentage sale of zero emission vehicles. Those are flexible regulations. So this is just summarizing then um, that it's a simple path, right? The simple path is you've got to work on these sectors. It's fuel switching focus on them, and you do it with compulsory policies. And if you, if you can hold that in your mind, that'll help you assess politicians and, what's, and what, what it, what's needed and who's faking it and who is not. And so when you see this simple path, then you might say, okay, why aren't we following it? Or why aren't we following it as aggressively as we should be? Because for three decades, experts have known that a coordinated global effort won't happen voluntarily that electricity and transportation decarbonization is achievable, and it's globally critical, as I showed. Renewables won't beat fossil fuels without a carbon price or regulations. So if experts know this, then what's holding back decarbonization? So my last sets of slides um, are going to summarize what are these things that have been holding us back. And I'm gonna warn you in advance that I'm, you know, my summary of these is only cursory and all of sort of detailed discussion. So I, I don't want you to think that I take it light because I have to go quickly through them. That's why I wrote the book. The book goes into detail on many of these. Um, and so um, please keep that in mind. The first are deliberate delusions. And this, this refers back to the Upton Sinclair quote, people in the fossil fuel industry, they, they have, and we're, you know, those of us who are climate concerned are very well aware of the deliberate promotion of myths to stall action, the climate science is uncertain, this next fossil fuel project's essential, or we have to wait for major innovations to decarbonize, which is not true, or that there's no point in acting until we have a global binding uh, agreement. Um, so I'm not gonna spend time on that. What else is holding it back? This relates to that earlier comment I made about um, you know, challenging these smart grad students uh, about their views on nuclear power. Like they might be against nuclear power, but maybe after thinking about it more, they might say, well, maybe some nuclear power in some jurisdictions. Oh, maybe some biofuel in some jurisdictions, maybe some large hydro. I shouldn't be having these rigid pro and con views. Um, and that's sort of what, you know, want to challenge people with, and I do, because the experts realize the complexity and say, hey, if you're going to have rigid pro and con views, the fossil fuel industry loves it, because we're letting perfection be the enemy of good. We need all of these things happening, um, or we need to be open to all of these things happening, you know, in different jurisdictions um, as part of this moving fast. We don't have time to be uh, self-indulgent and say, oh, I'm a principled person. I don't want biofuels used anywhere, no matter what. 
And just to give you a bit of an example of this, I'm going to just talk for a minute about a book I published 15 years ago, but I actually started writing it almost 20 years ago. It's called Sustainable Fossil Fuels, a deliberately provocative title. And the reason I wrote it is because even back then, I could already see how human bias was working in the energy system and with the climate issue and other environmental issues related to energy and, and, and you know, interacting a fair bit with psychologists and others. And it became so obvious to me that um, you know, if you believed we needed to act on greenhouse gas emissions, you also needed to be a compromiser. Because if you were sort of saying, oh, the rest of the world will agree with me and then we'll move on, that's kind of childish. It's like people are biased and maybe you're biased, maybe I'm biased. And so we need to take into account those biases. So environmentalists that I knew, not all, and I mean, I'm very close to many environmentalists, would, would basically be saying to people in fossil fuel endowed regions like Alberta, the future requires us to annihilate your economy. Now, you know, when you say that to someone, uh, if that's the message you're giving them, Basically, uh, they're going to take that, many, some of them, and just be very biased. They're going to try to you know, tell you the science is uncertain. They're going to they're spend a lot of money even to try to influence politics. Um, and so you need to be aware of that. So this book was an effort uh, to get people to say, well, wait a minute. Actually, in fossil fuel endowed regions, they could do carbon capture and storage and maybe still get value from their resources. So why don't we at least talk about that? So what is the environmental impact? What's the cost? Uh, and, and, and that discussion is still going on today. But I was very disappointed because a lot of the environmentalists just looked at that and said, oh, that's terrible. We don't want anything to do with fossil fuels. And I'm like, okay, fine. We'll, uh, we'll talk again in 20 years because you're part of the problem because you haven't been willing to compromise. <clears throat> Now, a whole bunch of other possible you know, biases, wishful thinking biases. And I'm, 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 I apologize, but I'm gonna scream through these. Is energy efficiency cheap and making money? Mostly it does not, because fossil fuels are cheap and their costs can fall. Natural gas is so cheap right now, it makes no sense to switch away from natural gas if you're only doing it to make money. Same thing for renewables. Um, and then a whole bunch of other things that you can read it right there, but I'm not, I don't have time, I'm sorry, to, to, to discuss them. But what I can say is that experts would agree that these things are wishful thinking biases, most experts, and that the fossil fuel industry loves these because they divert people from the bottom line, which is pricing and regulations to cause fuel switching to phase out the burning of coal, oil, and mostly natural gas. Another one is agenda hitching biases. And again, I'm not gonna do this justice um, because it's people who are saying, man, I have something else I really want. I want global equity, or I, I hate capitalism. I want us to end capitalism, or I don't believe anyone should eat meat or fly in airplanes. And therefore they, they, they say, wow, we can't solve climate change if we don't do this other thing that I think is really valuable for humanity and I want everyone to do it. So we, we hitch these objectives onto what was a simple task, which again was to fuel switch uh, in a few key sectors. And so we, we, we hitch all of this stuff with it. And some of these are very, I'm sure, many of you might agree, are laudable objectives, but they may be desirable. When they're hitched to the climate success, they make the challenge seem far more complex than it really is. You know, Naomi Klein says, we gotta, we've gotta dismantle capitalism. We gotta vote to do that, I presume. Um, and then we'll be able to solve this problem. And I, I, I don't see that. I see that there are countries that are moving fast in jurisdictions, California, that are capitalists. So the fossil fuel industry loves agenda hitching. Mm -hmm. And then finally, how do we deal with climate insincere politicians? Now, when I give a public talk, <laughs> this is when I would get a lot of fun laughter, um, because the point I would be making is that what if the climate insincere politicians are quite clever and they don't pose together for a photograph, but instead you have to figure out how to detect them. And so here's what I'm gonna uh, show what you're looking for. But it, and it's, I can go quickly because this is the corollary of what I've already been saying. Climate insincere politicians deliberately confuse actions and policies. They implement only the non-compulsory policies. 
they exaggerate the cost of the compulsory policies like a carbon tax. And so of course, the fossil fuel industry loves and rewards them. And so what are we looking for? You already know that's climate sincere politicians who implement compulsory policies, who implement a mix of, that's in electricity and transportation as well as buildings and light industry and so on. And then when it comes to the, the industries that are trade exposed, they've gotta be working more complex uh, strategies on driving innovation and low cost decarbonization, which I talk about in the book. And what does that mean? Well, it means you're gonna to link to other countries. So you need to link to other countries and say, let's all phase out our coal plants. Let's all phase out gasoline vehicles. Um, and let's put carbon tariffs on so that those countries that are not uh, acting along with the rest of us, and therefore their steel industry has an advantage or their aluminum industry, let's make sure that those countries uh, are not able to get away with that. Otherwise, we're just gonna stay on that voluntary global agreement delusion and never make progress. So here's where I have fun with a Canadian audience and maybe especially Western Canada is I'll put up uh, Justin Trudeau's photo and I'll say, is this a climate sincere politician? And people of course shout out, no. I mean, how can a climate leader build a pipeline? And so then I say, okay, well, let's look at the evidence about, you know, that, that we on the IPCC use to identify climate sincere and insincere politicians. What's been the government's approach since 2015? Well, it's relied almost entirely on pricing and regulations with rising stringency. It's leveraged its domestic efforts into a global effort. And so that's a general description of, of their policy approach. Now I'll give you the specifics right here. So Canada has passed a coal plant phase out and we're phasing out our coal plants. And that's happening, the deadline is 2030, but there's already actions happening because nobody wants to shut them all down at once. We've also started a global coalition called Powering Past Coal. Canada and the UK were leaders and now many countries are joining. And the idea is that that eventually is gonna to have to become a pressure unit. The government put in a carbon price that was difficult politically, but they survived the election and it's going to continue to rise every year. They've also put in um, a pricing system for our trade exposed industry uh, that has similar kinds of packaging, although it's protective of those industries to some extent. And methane regulations and now a clean fuel standard that can have a really significant impact uh, if we do it right, uh, especially in the phasing out of gasoline and diesel. So that's what's been going on with the Canadian government. And so that's what why I like to leave people with this question. Hmm, they're building a pipeline, and at the same time, they're doing these things. Now, you're gonna to have to decide, what do you think about that? What do you do about it? So in summary, the climate concerned citizen must simplify, work to elect and support climate sincere politicians, push them to implement flag re flex flexible regulations and or carbon pricing, push them to make alliances for global coal or gas phase out and carbon tariffs, and, and also then when you do that, as has happened in British Columbia, where 10 years ago, we passed policies that prevented BC Hydro from contracting with future coal plants and natural gas plants, we have zero emission electricity. And when you have zero emission electricity, when you've succeeded in that sector, then you can move fast in other sectors. You can get an electric car, you can get an electric heat pump. And when you do that, your personal emissions basically fall to zero and happy to talk about that. But that's really where your emissions are coming from. So I end with asking, how do climate concerned citizens get climate sincere politicians? And in the book, I elaborate a lot more on this, but in the interest of time now, I wanna end by just saying that uh, you have to identify those politicians, you have to help them to get elected. And when they're not in power, you have some difficult choices to make. Um, because it looks like if you really believe that this is, a sincere, is as serious a global threat as the scientists are telling us, and I do, I believe the scientists, then I have to ask myself, you know, what should I be doing? What should I be doing when I have, when my fellow citizens elected a government that tricked them or you know, that was climate insincere in various ways? Now in my own personal life, I'm lucky because I am an expert in this area. And so I have, I, I have access to the media, I can write books, I, um, I can, here's a photo of me appearing before the US Congress in Washington, DC. 
uh, as a uh, as a witness um, uh, explaining why uh, President Obama should not approve uh, the Keystone Pipeline. This is in 2013. So I mean, I have all those avenues. But at the same time, let's say we, we get into a period as we did when the Harper government was in, and my fellow citizens had elected um, a government that was climate insincere, I needed to ask myself, what is it that I should be doing? And as Bill McKibben, a well-known environmental writer said, planet Earth is miles outside its comfort zone. How many of us will go beyond ours? And although I'd never been um, arrested uh, in my 20s or 30s or 40s, um, you know, in my 50s, I ended up believing that that was part of me and many other people signaling to fellow Canadians the seriousness of this. And Stephen Harper, when he was defeated, was defeated. Uh, polls show that he was not trusted as being sincere on climate. To the extent that actions by people like me got some media attention, maybe that contributed. I'll never know. And I'm not, it's not someone that I, I do believe in peaceful protest. I don't necessarily, you know, uh, argue for civil disobedience. In this case, I felt it was important. 13 of us in White Rock blocked coal trains all day. Uh, you know, it was, a, and then um, were taken to jail. As you see, I'm in handcuffs there on my way into the paddy wagon. Uh, and there are real personal risks involved in doing that. And I accepted those. We could have been sued for our own personal property and so on. But my, my point is that I think every one of us has to confront ourselves with that, that question of how we behave, depending on the sincerity of our government. And so I end now just with uh, an example of you know, that question, what influence can, a, can citizen activism have? And so you have a young girl you know, sitting outside the Swedish parliament by herself, and then um, look how that changed, right? With her comment that no one is too small to make a difference. And that kind of echoes a, a famous quote of Margaret Mead that's been around for a long time. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And so I end now with a quote of, uh, um, of Albert Einstein to say that those who have the privilege to know have the duty to act. And I know, and now you know as well. So thank you very much. Um, so I'm done, and now I want to uh, make sure that I find, where is it here? Participants. Chat. Okay. Okay. So, so Nastenka, um, I'm... Yes, thanks, Mark. Uh, <laughs> Can you see the chat? So I, I think I just saw maybe one question coming in. Yep, and I'm sure they'll come in. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so Vivian, I don't know if you can see her or would you like me to read it to you. So Vivian was asking about given the epidemic crisis, uh, a global response may be more achievable in the future. That's what she is. Yeah. Yeah. So her question is, given the, the, the COVID epidemic crisis, mm -hmm. um, you know, is a global uh, response uh, more achievable in the near future? Mm -hmm. And hopefully this is not a wishful thinking bias uh, or a myth. And, yeah, so that's what she was referring to, alluding to. to yeah. And so actually, um, we do have to be careful about thinking that um, we can solve all of this now and I'll uh, through, you know, as we come out of this COVID epidemic and I'll explain why I don't want to, I can't take too much time on this. Um, I actually did a, a, a 14 minute interview on this on CBC's The Current um, on Earth Day, I believe it was with um, Matt Galloway. And, you know, he asked me this very question. And so I'm just summarizing a minute some of the points I made. One was that we, we who uh, study human use of energy and therefore their emissions note that people often are, um, what we're often wrong on is that we think that the very immediate past is really important that we project it into the future. That's when we're mostly wrong. So the price of oil is going down, people keep thinking it's gonna go down, it's gonna go up, keep going, going up. We're the same with house prices. And 
um, that's when we tend to be wrong as forecasters. And so we're not paying attention to the longer term phenomena and the, uh, you know, an underlying phenomena. And the reality is, is that um, this COVID uh, pandemic, what we've done is we've stopped using our cars and our, um, some of our factories and our restaurants, some of our buildings, schools, restaurants. And so of course, energy use has gone down and emissions have gone down, but we have not destroyed the fossil fuel burning equipment, none of it. Um, we're not crushing airplanes right now. Those airplanes are sitting there waiting, uh, being maintained and ready to be used again. So the question isn't, have, are we, have we used this to move away from fossil fuel burning equipment, uh, some burning coal, and, and we have not, definitely not. Um, so then the question is, well, maybe we'll have behavioral change. You know, we won't move around as much. Well, maybe, um, but maybe we will move around as much or we'll do it more in private vehicles. And, if, uh, and, and so there's this rebound effect that we've seen before. And you just saw it on my graph. After 2008, you know, fossil fuel use went way up as the economy recovered. So that's the most likely scenario. Then people say, well, maybe we can prevent that because if government is giving some stimulus money, why not make sure it's directed into things that reduce emissions? And yes, there are some things mm -hmm. we can do there, but it doesn't have much effect if you don't keep tightening mm -hmm. the key policies of pricing and regulation. An example for you right now is that oil prices are low. I mean, they've come back up a bit, but they're probably gonna stay quite low for a while. So that thing that I talked about that, you know, fossil fuels are cheap and my goodness, natural gas prices are really low and coal prices. So mm -hmm. all of the, you know, if I'm trying to get the Vietnamese not to build another coal plant, that's really difficult now after COVID as much as it was before, especially because governments are gonna be short of budgets. So what, what I, I and others are doing is saying, do not lose those compulsory policies, keep tightening them. That's more important than any money government might spend. Okay, so that's a short version of, a, of what can be a much longer answer, but I'm really glad that you asked that question, uh, Vivian. Um, Nastenka, if you want to guide me to individual questions and I'll find some of them, let's see, because I'm just okay. everything jumping all the time. Uh, after Vivian, who was below there, there was oh, oh, I see. upcoming American election. Lemon Brook is asking a question. Okay, so L Lamont asks, yeah, Lamont. Mm -hmm. how important is the upcoming American election? <laughs> and I think it's really important. Um, oh my goodness. Uh, you know, America is so important. Even if, uh, if Joe Biden wins and still, you know, in American politics, the Senate is important and, you know, and Congress and so I'm still not, even with the Joe Biden victory, I'm not hopeful for a dramatically improved kind of working relationship in the U.S. Senate. Um, but um, there's things that you can do at the executive level in the United States. And Obama showed that, like uh, President Obama, uh, you know, got a deal with the Chinese that was actually quite important. Now it's kind of, it's all been undermined by Trump. He helped to drive international um, um, negotiations. And I would argue that the tariffs I've been talking about are something that could be a kind of bipartisan thing that Americans could agree on. That if, if the, at an executive level, they are decarbonizing electricity and transportation, and that's what Obama was working on, and the president has some authority to do that, since CO2 is called an air pollutant, the president has authority, they can push that. Um, then the, there will be a real interest in the Senate and you know, in, in Congress as a whole to make sure that America is not disadvantaged relative to other countries. And in fact, when Americans have come close before, in 2010 and also in 2005, the John McCain bill, uh, the Waxman-Markey bill in 2010, all of these had implicit tariffs on, that would affect what's going on in the rest of the world. And that's more important than anything, because you already saw why. It isn't, you know, we need to be reducing our emissions in Canada and other industrialized countries because how else can we be putting on tariffs? Um, but at the same time, um, this, this has to be happening around the world. And so how do you make that happen? The next question here is from uh, Sybil. Um, given that we need to get to net zero by around 2050 after actions on fuel switching, 
how do we get to net zero? Right, so um, I focused on fuel switching because uh, in Canada, if we just stopped burning fossil fuels, um, you know, if we phase them out by 2050, uh, that's going to get you about 80 to 85 percent of the way. I actually don't think we'll get to net. I, I don't. I think we won't get to zero by 2050. I think a lot of the land use stuff. We'll plant trees like crazy, but a lot of the land use stuff is not as easy as people say. So it, it, the really the reductions are in the phasing out of the fossil fuels. Now, if if we got to 80 percent reduction or 70 percent reduction by 2050, I'd be thrilled. I probably won't be around, but. Um, you know, it's it, it, like, I'm not going to worry if it's 80% or 100% by 2050. Obviously, to get to 100%, then, if you don't think you can do some things, <clears throat> you know, if there's emissions coming from some sources that aren't related to burning fossil fuels, then you need to be thinking about capturing carbon from the atmosphere and burying it underground. And of course, people are working on those technologies, as I know you know. And uh, an example right now is um, on the prairies, we're gonna close down these coal plants. Uh, the great fear for me is, and others is that they're gonna, we're gonna replace them in part with natural gas plants, and that doesn't help much. But there's a, a, a movement of uh, academics and activists on the prairies and more in Saskatchewan to say, hey, do what we're doing in a lot of other jurisdictions, the Danes in England, elsewhere, convert uh, some of those coal plants to biomass. To, from quick growing poplar uh, plantations and so on in, in lands that are you know, not prime for agriculture. Um, and so then we'd be able to get energy from the plants, capture the CO2 emissions and bury them. And these would be net negative ways of getting um, electricity, for example. Now I see from Stephen, yeah, uh, Mark, so I think we're running out of time, but I think there are very interesting questions. So if you have 10 more minutes, maybe and people are welcome to continue joining us. And if they need to leave, feel free to do so. But yeah, so I just wanted to let you know that. Thanks, Ms. Tanka. I appreciate you saying that. So yes, I'm, I'm fine with that. So I understand that some people may leave the call now. They have other things to go to. Um, thanks for listening to me. Uh, and um, and I want to say that you can you can see from the back last slide uh, there's various ways that you can get a hold of the book and I encourage you to do that and if you like it to encourage other people uh, to read it. Um, so I've got a question here from Stephen. Uh, how can we help developing countries to decarbonize their electricity and transportation? Right. So <sighs> help. <laughs> um, you know, we're not going to help them a great deal. Um, because where does that money come from, right? The money has to come from our taxes. Um, and, you know, we're not really that, that unselfish when it comes to this. But there are ways to form coalitions that help to lower the costs of these technologies. So let's just talk about electric vehicles. Electric vehicles in, um, the, why are the Chinese developing electric vehicles? Well, guess what? Go into you know, Beijing or Shanghai, or Delhi, or, or basically the capital city of almost any developing country, and, um, or the large cities, and the air quality is horrendous. We all know about that. And it's from you know, gasoline cars and diesel cars and trucks. And, um, and what's interesting, um, if you want to call it a co-benefit, is that the people, that the, the elites in those countries, the people who are in government, business, running society in various ways, the media, uh, they care about their loved ones and their loved, they and their loved ones are usually living in these large cities. And so as a country, you know, even gets a little bit wealthier and as the costs of things like electric vehicles are falling, um, then there's a great motive uh, for those people in the developing countries to even you know, themselves say, we're, we're going to make sure that we don't have coal plants around our large cities, that we have electric vehicles, and we're going to put regulations to that effect. And by them doing that, and then if we're doing that really rapidly as well, so Norway's going the fastest, British Columbia and Canada should easily be going as fast as Norway, which means that within five years, you wouldn't be selling anything but electric, and, you know, cars and the odd biofuel truck, perhaps. Um, 
and, and that's what that's that would help developing countries because it would be part of bringing the cost down for everyone and then hopefully we would be helping them as well in various ways for example putting on tariffs and saying that some of the tariffs that we collect um, we're going to pass back to developing countries to those who are making advances in reducing their greenhouse gas you know who have the compulsory policies in place at the rising stringencies that experts can tell us those will make a difference so there are ways to reward the developing countries to reward them financially if they're trying to be onto that path and and there are various people who have developed scenarios about this a recent article in foreign affairs by Bill Nordhaus, the Nobel Prize winner in economics a couple of years ago, is a good example uh, of this. Now, I'm trying to help the developing countries. I can't seem to find my arrow to slide down to the next question. Um, okay, so we have. Oh, there um, it is. I found it. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, wait a minute. Um, right, so this is. Um, okay, Nina's asking about, you know, how do we increase public involvement in climate action? Um, feel that whenever you attend such events, the audience is quite niche, absolutely, uh, even though the general public appears to be interested in sustainability um, and, and feels that younger generations are important. I agree with all that you've said, um, but, uh, you know, at the same time, I think what I try to do in this book is I, I mean, I am trying to get the book communicated more widely to, to let people not feel despair, like that it's an incredibly complicated problem and there's very little that I can do, or it, there's too many things that I need to do. Uh, I have to stop using plastic straws and you know, the, all of these things that are, I gotta stop eating meat, I gotta stop being on an airplane. I think it just makes it really uh, overwhelming for people. My book tries to give a different message, but also when it comes to change, when it comes to the jurisdictions that are leading, what you'll find, and this is, I hope, heartening, is that it's a small group of um, concerned citizens that play a big role. Um, even when we had, uh, you know, when we had a period, well, the period we're in right now in British Columbia, but the period we were in 10 or 12 years ago, 15 years ago, when we had a government that was a right of center government, but what actually ended up such that we were the leaders in North America on climate policy or neck and neck with California. And it was a small group of people that really motivated that government uh, to act. And so that's why the message near the end of my talk here and the message in the book is to really think about how to be strategic in how you act. And of course, the, the ideal is to have success politically. But if you don't have success politically, how can you behave as a citizen? Um, what, what does it mean to protest? What are, you know, what are the range of options? finding like people. And that is how the jurisdictions that have had some success, that, that's how that's kind of come about. So that's my, my general message is to look where we have had success. That's how we do it. It will be a small percentage of people that are actually active on this. Uh, funny, every time I do this, I lose my arrow. There it is. Um, the next one was fossil fuel companies in future. Uh, transition into renewable energy or going out of business? <laughs> uh, good question. The, the, so the, what's the, uh, somebody's asking, what's the future role of fossil fuel companies? And I think it's gotta be a combination of, of those two things. One of them being that in part, they will find, some, they will become different. Um, some of them will actually just go out of business, which is fine. They don't, they don't see a way and others will uh, diversify. And clearly it's easier for some, and like if you're in a, it's just not dark, uh, black and white. If you're in a, you have particular skill sets, let's say the chemical industry and it was the petrochemical industry. Well, I think they'll easily transition into the chemical industry. We'll still make chemical products, plastics and so on. And more of them will be from a biomass feedstock or whatever. We also have a lot of things like, um, you know, putting uh, carbon underground. So fossil fuel companies are excellent at that. So the BECs, the bioenergy carbon capture and storage, I was talking about with coal plants in Saskatchewan, companies can easily segue, transition uh, into that. 
that we'll be using more hydrogen, so the hydrogen economy. And if you were a coal plant, make, yeah, as I said, you coal plant making electricity, you can be, uh, the same company can, uh, can use biomass to make electricity. So wherever there's an opportunity to use the skill sets they already have, that should be no problem. Um, where the company, you know, let's say a coal mining company, or even I think some of the, the whole thing about the oil sands, um, you know, I just don't see much of a future for that. But again, even those companies like Suncor are also buying into renewable energy. They're hedging their bets. They're starting to see that transition. Um, and then someone says, okay, someone is just, thank you, thank you, okay. Um, if we're, ah, so this person asks, if world peoples were to establish democratic representation, um, so let's say a greater spread of <clears throat> democracy, um, would it be easier to implement climate sincere policy measures? Um, and then there's more to the question, but I'll just stop on that one. I mean, that's an interesting question. Does, um, you know, does more democracy uh, lead to a greater chance of uh, people in the developing world uh, acting on um, greenhouse gas reduction on the climate threat? And I guess that I would argue that the jury is out on that. And the reason is, um, well, it, it relates to those first three challenges that I talked about at the beginning, that fossil fuels are fantastic. And so whether it, you know, it didn't matter what kind of government you were, you went and used fossil fuels, whether it was the East Bloc countries using coal and oil and natural gas from Russia, you know, in the 1970s and 80s, and, um, or whether it was China in the 80s and 90s using coal, uh, you know, and these were not democratic governments or looking at the, uh, but when we get to democratic governments, um, you know, same thing. So it's, it's the challenge is really that fossil fuels are quite fantastic. And so it could be that the Chinese with an undemocratic, or I would call it undemocratic uh, system of government uh, might be, you know, the, are showing themselves in some ways um, to be um, early movers now. I mean, they, now that they've partly industrialized, there's still lots of poverty in China but they're early movers on wind power, solar panel power, electric vehicles, and even doing more nuclear uh, as a way of trying to stop the rise of their emissions, which they're starting to be very successful on, and then starting to reduce. And now Jennifer asks, um, so I guess I've got maybe- I think, time. yeah, I think we don't have more time, Mark. Yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah, so we are about, yeah. Okay, so I'll, ask, I'll answer this minutes? last one. So Jennifer says, can Canada meet its climate targets while still expanding the oil sands. And if the oil sands are emitting in the production uh, process, then, then we probably can't. Um, but you know, that doesn't mean that you necessarily, and, but it also depends on what goes on globally, because if global oil prices stay really low, then oil sands will not grow uh, and may even contract slowly. So thank you, that's my, uh, the last question that I'm able to handle and now I'll, as I said, um, uh, people can get a hold of me. Uh, I mean, I do get a lot of emails, so I don't want to encourage too many, but um, uh, you, it's possible to, to get a hold of me, but also to follow me on Twitter and to look at my blog to learn more about this. And as I say, to find out as well about how to get, get a copy of the book. So I thank uh, Nastenka and all of the audience for listening to me and I'll hand it back to you, Nastenka. Thank you very okay, much. Thanks. Thank you, thank you, Mark. Very interesting talk as always and thanks to all the audience participants for your excellent questions. I just also want to remind that the book is also available free online so I don't know if you mentioned that uh, Mark but I just would like to end up by reminding you all of you that we have our last talk of the series next week on, on Wednesday at the same time from 12 to 1 and we're going to be uh, showcasing what SFU uh, uh, led organizations from SFU students, the Disability Office are doing related to climate action and also learning about fixes and the opportunities that researchers, solution seekers have to get involved with fix. Okay, so thank you so much for joining us and hope to see you next week. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Mark.